So one of the things that living through two years of the pandemic have done uh, has proven to us that first off, we can gather together like this electronically. We can share information, we can socialize. It's not as fun as being in person, uh, but the a silver lining that I believe our speaker this evening may be talking about is that our separation has led to a very rapid rise in, a, in a, an augmented style of communicating between healthcare professionals uh, and their patients. So as always, I'm Tim Gibbs, the director of the Academy DPHA. Welcome, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kate Smith, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Over to you, Kate, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, welcome everybody to, this is our fourth Thursday, um, and here we are on the 17th. I too am wearing green. Um, let me just click over here. Oh, yes, of course. There we go. Um, all right. So um, odds and ends, same old, same old. Please change your name, um, your username to the full name you use to register for the class by clicking participants, hovering over your name, choosing more and clicking rename. Please stay on mute throughout. If you do have questions um, and you don't put them in the chat box, just raise your hand and we will unmute you. We will hold questions until the end of the presentation. All the sessions are being recorded. Um, everything so far is available up on minimed, uh, DelawareMinimed.org. Um, Attendants, please choose one. Some of you are already putting your names in the chat. That's great, thank you so much. Please make sure you do so before 7.15. If you are attending on the phone or you don't have access to chat, please just email me before nine o'clock this evening uh, with our word of the day, which today is luck because it's uh -huh. Patrick's day. See what I did there? Very clever. So without further ado, let me introduce, oh, I didn't change that, I'm so sorry. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Patel, who will be speaking about telehealth, not sports medicine, did not change the title, my bad. Um, Dr. Patel is a practicing virtual primary healthcare physician who serves as the Associate Medical Director of the Center for Virtual Health. He is a faculty member in the Internal Medicine Pediatrics Residency Program and a Clinical Assistant Professor at Sydney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University. His major focus is to use a data-driven, innovative, consumer-centric approach to improve the delivery of care for the community served. After completing his residency at Christiana Care, Dr. Patel spent two and a half years practicing clinically at MedStar Health and served as the Associate Medical Director for Ambulatory Quality and Safety. He rejoined Christiana Care in the fall of 2017, and in addition to his clinical practice, he served as the clinical leader for the organization's largest primary care practice and senior physician investigator for the Value Institute. Dr. Patel is board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the American Academy of Pediatrics. His research and operational interests have focused on optimization of digital care delivery, creation of innovative care models for chronic care management and health promotion, and fostering a work environment where everyone finds value in their workplace. Dr. Patel, I will stop my screen sharing and then I will send it over to you. Thank Sounds you. good. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, Kate. And it's always great to see you, Tim. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. Can you yep. set, can you guys see in the, perfect. Yep, that's good. Is it advanced to the next slide? I'll take yep. that as a, perfect. Um, so welcome again, uh, and thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I know Kate and Tim had both asked me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, sort of my story. Uh, Kate was able to provide a uh, sort of a bi biography, but I'll, sort of tell you a little bit about my upbringing, what sort of drew me to medicine and, and what brought me to where I am right now. Uh, and then we'll chat a little bit about sort of the current state of healthcare, as, as Tim alluded, you know, pre-pandemic, the way we provided care was 
uh, vastly different to how we're providing care now in terms of the, the modality. And we'll touch base on sort of how care was, uh, and then we'll dive a little bit deeper in terms of what is virtual health, what's digital health, some of the definitions, just so that we all have uh, the same sort of mental model of some of these terms. Um, and then we'll probably focus most of the time talking about sort of what's trending uh, in virtual care, digital health, what's occurred over the last few years, you know, where do we see ourselves uh, in the coming years, and then sort of a deep dive into our program here at Christiana Care Center for Virtual Health and how we've been able to take some of the market learnings, some of the learnings from providing care to individuals with COVID, and then now providing sort of this longitudinal virtual care for individuals, and then open it up to questions thereafter. So a little bit about myself. Um, as you can see from some of the pictures uh, in the top left, uh, I was born and raised in New York. Um, my parents had uh, immigrated to this country a few years before I was born. And, you know, I was born into a family of healthcare professionals. Uh, my dad had done his medical school in India, uh, immigrated to this country and had done a uh, sort of a primary care residency uh, in New York. And, you know, Pretty much from a very early onset, um, seeing my dad practice, I really recognized the, the role of sort of the primary care doctor, the role of a quarterback for someone who's taking care of someone's entire care and also taking care of not only the patient, but many of their individuals and their family. And, you know, he, he currently is still practicing in, in, in the inner city of Bronx and has a pretty uh, large population that he serves is, uh, you know, lower socioeconomic. And as a child, I, you know, I was able to see how he was able to use uh, not only his clinical knowledge and care, but then also using resources and, and social care and a lot of the things that now we're talking about social determinants of care, uh, pretty, pretty early on in my upbringing, sort of seeing how he was uh, practicing medicine. So I think that was sort of my initial insights into practicing care, recognizing that it's, you know, a combination of taking care of the patient and their clinical needs, but also, you know, a lot of the contributors to their care uh, and a lot of the social aspects of care. So, you know, fast forward through sort of high school. And then, you know, once uh, I decided that I wanted to sort of pursue a care in medicine, I knew that it was more than just providing clinical care. I mean, I recognized, you know, from my dad that, you know, he was doing a lot more for the community and it sort of drew me to go to, you know, college in upstate New York, where it was a uh, combined degree program, both in, intro, both in um, sort of an undergraduate degree, uh, a master's in business administration, along with uh, the medical degree. And, and I think I knew that, you know, this sort of broad training will provide, you know, that you know, the skill set and the, and the insights uh, along with the backbone that, you know, has been very uh, helpful to sort of where I am right now. And then fast forward to 2011 after graduating from uh, medical school, um, uh, my girlfriend at the time and then uh, now wife um, matched here for residency. So we met in medical school and came to Delaware. Neither of us uh, are from uh, this area. You know, we, you know, I grew up in New York, she grew up in Boston. And I think, you know, other than, you know, driving through Delaware, neither of us knew much about Delaware, but we fell in love when we came uh, to visit Christiana Care, recognizing that it had this hybrid approach of being an academic setting, uh, but at the same time, really invested in providing to the community. And I think mean, both of us found that to be pretty eye-opening along with quite different from some of the other programs that we were looking at. Uh, so, you know, a little over 10 years ago, we transplanted from, you know, the Northeast uh, to the Mid-Atlantic um, to become Delawareans. And, you know, minus a little stint in, in Washington, DC, uh, for the better half of the past decade, uh, we've been Delawareans. Um, we have, you know, two, two great kids that are uh, three and five. And, you know, over the last five years, uh, in addition to sort of my clinical practice, uh, I've recognized, you know, 
that care is more than just the clinical aspects. Uh, it, it's a lot of the wellness aspects and, you know, I did a lot of exercising and, and playing sports as a kid. And, and, you know, four years ago, I joined Orange Theory Fitness and I've been a huge enthusiast and, and really uh, believe in, you know, high intensity int interval training and really combining strength training and, and aerobic training and has, uh, has been something that has, you know, changed my life and, and really focusing more on a, on a plant-based diet. And then lastly, uh, I was fortunate two years ago uh, to go through Leadership Delaware. Um, it's a year-long leadership development program where there's individuals throughout Delaware, uh, different sectors of industry from government, nonprofit, the financial industry, healthcare, education, where a group of individuals that are in their 20s and 30s come together, have the ability to meet and hear you know, top individuals throughout the state of Delaware, you know, really form this bond, you know, and it was, uh, it, it's been a great experience in terms of the, the network I've developed, how I look at problems, how I answer issues, uh, and it's made a, a huge impact on both my personal and professional life. And then lastly, I'll just sort of end with the, the you know, the quote in the middle in terms of, I was able to take a lot of these uh, lessons learned throughout uh, the, the last, you know, 30 plus years of my upbringing and my clinical training to really mirror my approach in providing care to individuals and really taking sort of a holistic approach and, and focusing on wellness. And, you know, I was not a huge technology enthusiast, you know, growing up, uh, but now I'm recognizing, you know, the value that technology can pr provide and how we can sort of enable forming and forging these relationships. And you know, a lot of the dots that I've collected um, are on the screen here. And now we have the ability of using Zoom and, and other sort of forms of technology to really bring it into action. So now you know, we'll start a little bit uh, similar to how Dr. Sandella started last week. Uh, I'd like to start with a, a case um, so this is, think about healthcare, you know, pre-pandemic. Uh, this is probably how healthcare is being provided even in some areas uh, during the pandemic and, and sort of uh, over the last few uh, months. But, you know, Ray is a 51-year-old man. Uh, he currently has Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is a government insurance uh, that's provided to individuals that are lower socioeconomic. Um, or have some other um, disability. And the, this individual hasn't seen a, a primary care provider in the past three years. Uh, he's currently not on any medications, uh, but he does take a multivitamin when he remembers because he often feels tired and lacks energy. Uh, he hasn't, he's been meaning to schedule a, a screening colonoscopy. So a colonoscopy is a, is a uh, test uh, that screens for or tests for colon, colorectal cancer. Uh, but he hasn't had time to wait on hold to make the appointment. And it does require taking a day off from work because you have to, they give you some sedation, you have to prep the night before. So uh, it is somewhat of a onerous process. Uh, he's also felt extremely overwhelmed with COVID and, and around job security. And, you know, the first step was, you know, potentially to see his primary care provider. So he tried to call to make an appointment, however, was told that, because he's a new patient and hasn't been seen in a number of years, that he'll have to wait uh, a few months before being seen. Uh, and being seen doesn't equate to getting all of the issues that he has uh, that I went through, both addressed, uh, taken care of, or resolved. So this is uh, something that many Americans and many people around the world uh, deal with on a day in and day out basis. And, uh, it's rather frustrating. And, and, you know, as someone that's in the healthcare field, I, I feel that we have the opportunity to, to improve uh, the experience for Ray and millions of others throughout the country. So how do we, so what, what's one way of, of um, sort of improving that? Uh, I, I strongly feel really looking at virtual health and, and digital health at the, as the sort of the larger umbrella term. And, you know, this is a slide that our team put together at the Center for Virtual Health 
a little over a year ago in terms of how do we as a system um, look at virtual health from a, a vision and a strategy standpoint. So we strongly feel that the future of healthcare is virtual. We, we know that there are some instances when in-person is needed. However, the vast majority can be virtual. And I'm hoping over the next 30, 40 minutes, uh, I'll be able to demonstrate why that's the case. Uh, anything that can be done virtually will be done virtually. And the home, um, and it's really just not the bricks and mortar practice will be the new venue of care. I think where everyone lives busy lives, either in school, work, uh, you know, dealing with family and things don't occur just eight to four or nine to five. Things are occurring throughout the day, weekdays, weekends, and by currently providing care just when an office is open uh, is just not gonna cut it. And you know, by doing all of these levers, you know, we'll truly hit population health. And you know, population health is a, is a buzzword that we're using in healthcare. And it's really just you know, the clinical care. You, know, you go from your home to see your provider, see your doctor either when you're well to get your immunizations, to get uh, you know, blood work done, or when you're not well going there to you know, getting evaluated and, and potentially being treated, um, in addition to all the things that influence one's uh, care. And, you know, that's a lot of the social care, social determinants. So if it's difficult for you to get to the office, then trying to incorporate transportation or other elements that may influence one's care uh, is sort of the social aspect. So if you take a lot of the clinical things that myself and some of my colleagues uh, may treat on a day in and day out basis and working with sort of our case managers, social workers, uh, and some of the other team members, if we work in concert with one another, we'll be able to provide uh, great population health and, and really be able to improve the outcomes for the, the populations that we're serving. Um, and, and I think that's ultimately where we wanna be. And we think that using you know, a virtual strategy and a virtual way of providing care will get us there. So whenever we're looking at sort of a framework for change, uh, we always go to the quadruple aim. Uh, so maybe some of the other speakers uh, may have touched on this, uh, but it's pretty simple. Uh, and I think in any business class or, or any sort of business plan that's put together, you really want to look at, you know, what are the key things that you want to achieve and to ensure that you're, you're achieving as many of the things that are that you're desiring. Um, and that's, you know, in the quadruple aim, the top left in the blue is really quality outcomes. So you, you want to provide care and get the best outcomes for people that you're serving, right? So that, that could be everyone that has high blood pressure, I wanna treat them really well and bring their blood pressure down. Or if there's you know, 100 people that I take care of that have diabetes, my goal is to provide them with the right medications and the right plan uh, to improve their diabetes and improve their control of their sugars. Uh, the, the next lever is the, the clinician or the caregiver experience. So this is uh, myself and the rest of uh, the team that I work with. We wanna make sure that whatever we do uh, is in alignment with their well-being uh, because you know over the last two years uh, there's been a lot of things that have gone on in healthcare around COVID and a lot of nurses are, are leaving the workforce a lot of providers are leaving the workforce uh, they're burnt out working long hours the, the computer systems don't work they're they're just fed up with things and you know we already have a an issue in terms of not as many people going into uh, either primary care or some or various other specialties. And if we start burning out clinicians, we won't have people to help others out. Uh, the bottom right is, is the patient experience or the customer experience. Uh, you know, we wanna make sure like in any industry, you, know, you, you go to school or you go to uh, get your oil changed or you go to the bank, uh, after that, you know, you're usually getting a survey on how things went and it's the same in healthcare. You know, two, three days after a visit, you're going to get a, a phone call or a text message and we really want to learn how did that experience go and we want to make sure that we learn from that experience and if there was an issue that went on, then 
we can improve uh, for the next inter interaction. And then the last uh, is affordability. Healthcare, as, as many of you know, uh, the costs just keep on going up. And you know, almost a fifth of our economy is spent on healthcare, and that number is just going to continue to go up. And with inflation and all the other things going on, we, we have to make sure that whatever cool programs we put in place also lower costs. And you know, if we if we're able to hit as many of these levers, we'll be able to grow and we'll be able to provide care to even more patients. So now just a little bit about the nuts and bolts uh, around what is virtual health. Um, so many of you over the last uh, two years have probably heard terms like virtual care, digital care, um, and oftentimes they're used interchangeably. Um, I'd like to say like the, the larger umbrella term is really digital health, digital care. And this is all things that you sort of think about um, in terms of that telemedicine interaction. So you have a sore throat, you think you have COVID, then you know, you'll FaceTime with a provider, you'll tell them your issues. And then you know, based on that, they make a decision of, hey, I think you need to get a COVID test. Hey, I think you need to come to my office. Um, or I think this is a sinus infection, here's the antibiotic. So that the telemedicine portion of it is really that rendering of that care. And that's really like just putting a video screen in front of what a regular interaction may be uh, with the provider. And I think we did a lot of that right when the pandemic started because there was a lot of concern around, hey, we don't want anyone in the office. You know, we were doing February of 2020, we were doing less than 1% of our visits in the outpatient arena was telemedicine. Fast forward. March 30th of 2020, 99% of our visits were telemedicine. So the first thing we did during the pandemic was we just equipped everyone with the ability to do video visits uh, or phone visits. And that was, you know, that, that was able to address some of the issues, but then we recognized that care is just not over a video visit or a phone visit. There's a lot of stuff that happens in between visits around education, calling back and forth with your provider. There may be a form you fill out in between visits. You know, I may wanna check in to see how you're doing with uh, your weight loss journey uh, based on the last conversation we have. And that's sort of where virtual health comes in where it's a lot of the asynchronous conversations. And you know, many of you that are currently in school uh, there's a lot of asynchronous learning that a lot of schools do one day or two days a week, and that's where you, you're probably given an assignment or you're, you're, you're given some information or things that you have to do, and then you do that on your own time, and then uh, that information is given to your teacher. So the same thing is what we do with our patients. Um, I'll send them a questionnaire around ADHD, and it may go to the parents the child along with their teacher, then all that information is collected and then we're able to make decisions uh, based on the information collected. And then the larger umbrella of digital health adds in a lot more additional layers. And this is sort of where the analytical things come in. This is where me as a primary care provider may have conversations with other specialists. Uh, we, we may have clinical algorithms or pathways. So if someone has this symptom plus this symptom, then there's a very high likelihood they have X condition. So some of these things, it's like coding could be put into our electronic health records so that when either myself or one of my team members puts in information, then it can help guide you in terms of what that diagnosis may be. It can then push out education to patients and it just makes it uh, a more holistic experience uh, for that patient. So knowing that, you know, virtual health, digital health is, is really the new frontier. And we know that there's so many cool capabilities that we can do with this. You know, the pandemic, as, as Tim alluded, was one of the silver linings was we've been able to use this technology that's been around for, you know, 10 plus years 
20 plus years, uh, but there's been very little use of it because of either billing issues, either because there was a fear that people may get sued or, or the, uh, you know, or individuals didn't feel comfortable because they want to always talk to someone face to face. We now know that this is a growing way that we can provide care and knowing that cost of healthcare is really expensive and we, we really want to move towards value care. So right now, a lot of care is if you come in to see me, then I give you a, a bill and either you pay it or your insurance company pays it, regardless of what that outcome is. So if you come to see me and I diagnose you with strep throat, but then in actuality you had COVID or I you know, you come in and I operate on you and I operate on your left knee, but it was supposed to be the right knee. I did a service, I collect money. And even though it was not correct or it didn't provide value to you, I still get paid. And we know that in other industries, you're not gonna pay money for something that wasn't fixed appropriately. Uh, so healthcare is in this sort of transition period. Consumerism, you know, I think we all know from that quadruple aim uh, graphic that I demonstrated that the patient voice or the consumer voice is a growing area that we're getting insights from. And unless we know what is working and what's not working, we really can't fix healthcare. So we know that consumerism and, and patient voice uh, is another area where we're getting information. We know that in general that our hospitals, uh, Christiana cared like during January, uh, there was a lot of things out there that we were in crisis mode and we just didn't have capacity in our hospitals to take care of people. We know that there is a lot of nurses and, and physicians leaving the healthcare industry. Uh, so there's just not enough people to take care of individuals. And then during heights of pandemics, there's just too many sick people uh, that we can take care of. So we know that we need to come up with some solution that we're able to scale how we provide to people. So rather than, you know, one provider take care of 2,000 people, you know, is there a way that one provider can take care of 5,000 people in a safe way? And then really trying to align with this home-based care strategy. Um, we know that we're all used to getting some service in our home, right? Right now, many of you are at home and you're able to zoom in and, and hear a little bit about digital health. You know, after this, you can then log in or, you know, turn your TV on and watch Netflix. Um, or, you know, during this talk, if you think about, hey, I think I need to get some, you know, clothes for summer, you know, you can hop onto whatever shopping app on your phone and, and get the uh, necessary things. So I think we're all used to consuming services or utilizing services in our home and and we're doing that in healthcare so we know that you know these are the the four main levers that we need to think about when we're creating a system and creating a product uh, that is needed for our community but we know that you know this is not going to happen overnight and there are tons of companies uh, that are in this space and you know every day, I'm getting messages on either LinkedIn or various other emails or blogs that I follow where you know, a lot of companies are coming together. There's newer companies that are being created and they're really trying to come up with something where we can better provide care. And, and you know, the first thing is around you know, shifting away from really doing things in silos, right? So, Oftentimes, uh, we may just think of, you know, the, the heart doctor will take care of, you know, your heart issues, your lung doctor will take care of your lung issues, uh, your endocrinologist or your sugar doctor will just take care of your sugars, but we know each of those things interacts with one another. And if you just try to fix one's heart problems, it may worsen their lung issues, or you uh, may not improve their lung issues, but if there's a way that you can improve multiple things at the same time, then it can 
very much improve, you know, the quality of life for the patient. And, you know, my big, my background is uh, I'm more of a systems person. So rather than trying to tackle a problem at a time, is there a way we can go a little bit more upstream to sort of see what all the issues are and then figure out a way in a more holistic approach to take care of that. And, you know, RPM and um, is remote monitoring, right? So as, as, as I alluded, one of the big things is now that we're providing care, we wanna provide care in the home, we need to come up with some way to monitor patients in the home. So, you know, Amazon, you know, Amazon or Alexa is always listening to everything that's going on and may then recommend some things that you can purchase when you go onto your app. So it's the same thing. Is there a way we can use the thing like Amazon or other devices to monitor something that's going on within your health? So monitor your heart rates, your blood pressures, how you're doing from an exercise standpoint. So is there a way that we can come up with something that monitors multiple aspects of your, um, of your health and well-being? Sort of the next uh, thing to sort of address is around uh, incentives. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, we get paid as a healthcare system uh, every time we provide a service, regardless of if it was appropriate or not. And we really want to shift to doing the right thing. And, and the right thing may not always be doing the procedure or having you come into my office. It may be a quick text message or hey, we can do physical therapy for a year before trying to do back surgery. And if we can focus on value rather than just seeing a patient every 10 minutes or really focusing on just doing as many things as possible, then we really can help to reduce the total cost of care, uh, which is a TCOC. And then everyone is aligned, right? So if, if I'm aligned, for reducing costs, the health system wants to reduce costs, and the payer, the insurance company wants to reduce, reduce costs, then we're all working in concert. But right now, there's not alignment, and each entity or each group, the provider, uh, the person who's paying for the care, um, and potentially the employer who's paying for the insurance company or for the insurance policy may have different motives or incentives. And then, you know, we really have to be able to scale, right? So it's great that we have all these cool, sexy toys and ways that we can monitor people, but to do that, it requires people to monitor. Uh, and we are having issues in terms of having people. So, you know, what are other ways that we can better utilize the technology and some of the reporting and the monitoring without adding in more humans to, to the equation. And then the last element is around really trying to come up with, you know, what is the return on investment? So it's great that we can give everyone an Apple Watch or give everyone a Fitbit, but at the end of the day, did that actually make a difference? Did, did we see improvements in weight? Did we then see improvements in the percentage of people that had diabetes or, or what or some other indicator that demonstrates that, hey, this $10,000 investment led to uh, this outcome. And then this next um, one is looking at, you know, some of the key players in the industry. So, you know, there's the, the payers, which is the insurance companies. We're now starting to hear, hear a lot about the, the pharmacies uh, that are now starting to become providers and then various different technology companies. So there's a lot of companies that are starting to enter this space, similar to organizations like Christiana that are also in this space. So there's starting to be some competitions with some of the multi-billion trillion dollar companies and some of these local companies to be able to effectively drive care where you can engage individuals, you have the ability to demonstrate, uh, you know, return on investment, you're monitoring, uh, and then you're also, you know, hiring the, the greatest providers to be able to take care of these uh, patients. 
So, you know, the, the next, you know, few slides, um, I just really want to go through sort of the top trends over the next, you know, one to two years in terms of where, where I see healthcare moving. Um, and, you know, the first is really this rise in on-demand healthcare. Uh, you know, patients want care on their own time. And, you know, as a practicing provider within our uh, virtual primary care, you know, our, our appointments from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., you know, we see more patients during that time period than we do from 8 to 12. And we know that's primarily because, you know, from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., people are not at work and it's on their own time. The other things that we're learning is that everyone has a smartphone uh, and the majority of browsing is occurring on mobile devices, not on computers. And being that most people have a smartphone, plus they're conducting a lot of searches and visits through that, I think people are starting to be, feel more comfortable using this technology to seek healthcare. Uh, the middle aspect of it is uh, we know that the traditional doctor that is going to be a you know family doctor for 30 plus years, you know someone like my dad, I think that that generation of physicians, that one generation above it is a, is, is a unique generation. And, and I don't believe that, you know, this current generation uh, of clinicians that I'm a part of will, you know, be in the same job for 35 years, uh, providing care for one specific community. And, you know, there's a lot more focus on work-life uh, integration, having more freedom. And, you know, even personally, you know, I like the ability to do multiple, to wear multiple hats. And, you know, if I have the ability to still wear, to still practice clinically where I can work at on a Saturday for a few hours and take care of patients because I can just log on and do that. Uh, I think there's going to be a rise um, sort of within this gig economy. And I, I've been working with a number of high school and college students that are interested in digital healthcare, and many are, you know, starting their own companies or, or side companies. Uh, so we're we're going to see a lot more um, with that. And then the last is really around that trusted internet and apps. I would imagine all of us, if we opened our phones, probably have at least five to ten apps that are healthcare focused within our um, within our phones, either our Apple phones or Androids, and, and many of them are in you know the mindfulness, exercise, nutrition, and sleep area. So we're already utilizing um, care in some degree. Uh, so why not have it all integrated so that me as as your primary care provider really know what you're doing on a day in and day out basis. The second is really around this importance of big data and how we can <laughs> effectively use it. So we know. Uh, we can aggregate a lot of information with big data. We can answer a lot of questions. Um, I think many of you on the phone here, fast forward five or 10 years, will probably have careers within data analytics and data architecture, because this is going to be critical for us to take, what, take the information, measure what matters, and then really take that into action. And that action could be how you market something, how you develop a new product, and then the last thing is really, you know, how can we use data to cultivate relationships? You know, Instagram and Facebook is doing an amazing job because you think of something and then when you look at your news feeds, they're already giving you information uh, about some things that you're thinking about purchasing. So how can we do that in healthcare in terms of, if I know what you're looking at and what, uh, what phase of life you're in, you know, providing in important information back to you so that you can make healthier decisions uh, for your life. The third is really looking at virtual reality. Um, we know there are a lot of conditions where this could be very, extremely helpful. You know, one area that we're using at Christiana is, is in the chronic pain space. We know that this is a huge problem, $80 billion with the opioid pandemic and, you know, virtual reality and, and trying to use that to mask one's pain uh, is far superior than giving Percocets or, 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 or opioids. So the more we can use 
uh, technologies like this. Uh, the other use case that we're using uh, within our cancer center is a lot of people ask here when they're getting chemotherapy. Um, so we then put goggles, uh, uh, the Oculus virtual reality on individuals when they're getting um, chemotherapy and we'll ask them, you know, what makes them happy if it's the beach, then we essentially there at the beach, you know, during that one or two hours that they're getting their chemotherapy, we found that they, uh, their overall well-being, their heart rates, their blood pressures are far superior um, with virtual reality than with standard care. Um, and then you can use this to motivate individuals um, in the education space. Uh, there's a lot of use cases with this. Uh, wearables, um, you know, I have, a, I have an iWatch or Apple Watch. Um, I would say probably 25 to 30% of the patients that we take care of have some wearable device. And this can allow you to sort of personalize your healthcare journey. It can, um, you know, insurance companies can use this information. It can lead to some, you know, incentives uh, and, and gamification. And, you know, we've been using a number of these devices within our practice um, from a blood pressure to various different fitness tracking or uh, step tracking and then heart rate track tracking, uh, monitoring your heart rhythm. So a lot of different tools that we have and it's just a matter of being able to use these tools in, a, in an effective way. Uh, so this is a, a screenshot from a, a patient of mine who has an Apple Watch. Uh, she joined our practice uh, a few months ago. And you know, if you look at the weight, um, maybe a little bit small on your screen, but her weight was a little bit over 170 pounds uh, when she joined the practice, uh, I think six months ago. She's now down to 155. And essentially she has a fitness tracking device. And then through the relationship that we built and, and some of the asynchronous texting, <coughs> Uh, we've been able to see an improvement of her weight and she doesn't have to text us or any of this information because she has an Apple watch and, you know, she steps on her scale and all that information seeks, goes to her Apple health app. And then it automatically pushes to us and I'm able to see her weight, her blood pressures, how much she's exercising. You know, if you dive a little bit deeper, you could see how many steps she's doing. So our, our team's able to use this, use this information to, to really drive uh, engagement. And then the last uh, element is really around predictive healthcare. So, you know, you take a lot of this big data, you take, you know, some of the insights, uh, some of this wearable data, um, maybe uh, other information about blood work, uh, genomics, and then there's just so much you can do with this. Uh, and we're really just getting to the tip of the iceberg. You know, right now we're able to predict disease and you know, I imagine many of you on the call here, you know, five, 10 years from now, we'll be able to use a lot of this information to personalize how we provide care to everyone so that we may not treat every person that has COVID the same or every person that has high cholesterol the same or every patient that has diabetes the same. Because, you know, right now we have, you know, the, the tier one medication, tier two medication, and we may know, you know, this may work better with certain ethnic groups than others, but there's probably a lot more we'll learn and, you know, through predictive healthcare and personalized healthcare, we'll be able to get there and hopefully take better care of the population. Um, so the, in the interest of time, I'll um, talk a little bit about what we're doing um, at the Center for Virtual Health. So hopefully you've got a sense of, of a lot of the market forces sort of the, the key trends of, of where we're going. And here at Christiana, I think we've recognized and embraced technology, um, a lot of the different digital tools, but I think we're trying to humanize that care experience because we know that if it's technology alone and digital alone, it's not gonna lead, lead to the best outcomes. And it's a, a combination of technology plus the people. And, you know, this is just a, uh, a few of my team members uh, within our virtual primary care practice. Um, and it's really about this team that's really uh, leading and driving to better outcomes for the patients. You know, so think about, you know, you as a student that's 
the patient at the center and the patient is always sort of at the center of, of how we're providing care. And then surrounded by that is all of the various different healthcare team members. So, you know, providers, nurses, uh, pharmacists, social workers, uh, behavioral health specialists. And, and, you know, I think our most probably important role within our center is this patient digital ambassador. And, and I think over the last two years, we know that not everyone understands and is able to utilize technology at the same aptitude. And, and there is, uh, you know, digital equity issues. And our patient digital ambassador is really, you know, that glue or that, you know, that the intermediary between the patient and the and rest of the, the center and the rest of the primary care team and, and can help with all of the digital needs, all the technology needs, um, along with connecting you with the right person on the care team. And, and we know that not all care is going to require the physician. You know, some of it may be the nurse, some of it may be the pharmacist, or some of it may be administrative that the digital ambassador can take care of. So this is a unique role that we've created. And it's something that, you know, our patients are loving. You know, I got a, a comment from a, a, a patient uh, who said that, you know, in the 60 years I've been seeing doctors, uh, I've had more interactions and conversations with Natasha, who's my PDA in the last three months than I have had with anyone collectively in the healthcare system. And because of that, I have gotten my colonoscopy, which I've never gotten. I got my flu shot this year. I've had my blood pressure controlled because she's able to explain why this is important and it's breaking down all the barriers so that I'm able to get it done. And you know, our principles are, are, are very similar to you know, a lot of my philosophies in care. And it's really, rather than doing a lot of sick care, which is what we do in healthcare, is you know, how can we really focus on all the well care? Um, how can we prevent diseases from happening? You know, if we can get everyone the COVID vaccine, then you know, we won't have as many people in the hospital. If we get people screened for breast cancer, colon cancer, we'll detect it earlier and we'll have less people from dying from cancers. You know, if we, if we do a better job in screening people for high blood pressure, diabetes, and catch it when it's pre-diabetes, pre-hypertension, we can prevent diabetes and hypertension from happening. So it, it's not rocket science. I think we've known this for so many years and the current way of providing care hasn't led to great screening rates. So is there a way that we can use or augment technology and this digital interactions and this continuous care for us to improve uh, those rates? And then on the right side of the screen, you can see wellness. So a lot of those aspects of mindfulness, exercise, nutrition, sleep, these are the things that if we do a great job working on at, from an adolescent age, then a lot of the middle category in terms of chronic disease will not occur. Uh, but we know if one does have a chronic disease that we want to make sure that they're controlled as, as much as possible. And when we can use monitoring remotely, we can use, you know, texting back and forth, looking at one's numbers, you know, addressing any barriers to getting medications and doing that as quickly as possible when those problems arise than waiting three months, six months, a year for your next uh, office visit. And I think, you know, it's pretty easy to tell, like, what are things that we can do to stay healthy? I think that these are things that we learn in health class uh, pretty, from, a early, uh, from an early age. And I think it's something that is taught early, but it's difficult to do. And uh, we're really hoping, you know, through gamification, you know, through having these conversations uh, back and forth that we can lead to a healthier diet. Uh, better exercise and, and living a healthier lifestyle. So, you know, how we provide care, uh, it's pretty simple. Um, as, as mentioned, most people have a smartphone. Uh, they have the ability to text us uh, when they want to have a visit or um, just go onto the app and, and schedule an appointment. It's almost like Open Table or any other app uh, you want to set up a time to go to the restaurant or to the barber or, or you know, do your check-in with 
your school teacher, the parent parent teacher conference. Uh, everyone's used to using, you know, Survey Monkey or, or Sign Up Genius or whatever tool that is, uh, and that's sort of our uh, front door with our patients. Highly accessible. We know that care doesn't occur just eight to five when offices are open. We know that you know having having extended hours is extremely important. Being open on weekends, uh, twenty four seven coverage. You know we're not closing during lunch hours because of how large our care team is. And you know no question is a silly question. You know we're available. People can text us at any time. Obviously, if it's an emergency, then we we get back to you. If it's not an emergency, we'll get back to you the next day. Um, and we're really that quarterback of care and we're that first person that you reach out to in terms of, hey, I have an issue, and then we can guide you to the next step. You know, this has been a huge um, a positive for many of our patients. They feel greatly connected to our providers. There's not as much stress that they're having. You know, people would have high blood pressure when they go into the office and then the doctor will say, hey, just check your blood pressures at home and then bring a log the next time you see, next time I see you, that may or may not occur. Um, but we now have other ways to capture that information, no more waiting rooms. And normally, you know, prior to the pandemic, when I was practicing in, in an office, you know, you would have 20 minute, 30 minute appointments. And during that appointment, you know, you may see the, the medical system, there, was, there may be some wait time and you may have 10 to 15 minute FaceTime with your provider. I'm probably having double the amount of FaceTime with patients. I feel more controlled, uh, more calm when I'm talking to them. You can have face-to-face -face, um, you know, or video-to-video -video conversations and you can share with them your screen or other education things. So it's, it's just a better experience uh, for me and, and the patients that we're serving. And I, I hope you've been able to see that there's so many things we can do at home in terms of monitoring. There's, uh, we have the ability to work with, uh, and we're working with a few different companies that you know, do nutrition and meal planning. And then sort of this next frontier is, you know, are there ways that we can do home lab testing? It's sometimes hard for people to go to the lab. They may forget if we can send you something you prick your finger or you do a swab and then send it back. We can then get the result to you. So the, the, there's a lot we can do in, in the home testing space. You know, we often get asked, you know, what if the patient needs to be seen in person? Uh, but so many of the things could be done virtually. You know, our job can, is really take the history, take the information, and then our team can very quickly figure out, hey, do you need to go to the emergency room? You know, can I treat you with this medication? Can I mail you a kit out so that you can get tested? Um, you know, is there urgent care or is there a, a local community site that we can send you to, to so that you can um, get the care that's needed? Um, next month, we're, we're launching a mobile van, which has the ability to go to a school and we can do uh, you know, immunization clinics, we can do school physicals, we can do a whole slew of other uh, health screenings that we may currently not have the ability to do, and then just leveraging a lot of the technology at home, and then when needed, um, going out to the home, and really going back to the way that care was provided when, uh, you know, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, when, when the doctor was coming to your home. And then if we're unable to do it, sort of virtually or in the home, you know, are there creative ways that we can uh, forge relationships? So during the pandemic, we were able to forge relationships with a number of different community centers. Uh, patients and consumers uh, felt comfortable going there and we met them where they were. Uh, we've done a, a pilot with a barber shops. Um, we found that certain me uh, a lot of men oftentimes may not go to their doctor. There, there may be some uh, mistrust. However, there is trust uh, with their barbers and they were going to their barbers every four to six weeks. So is there a ways that you can do blood pressure monitoring and screening within barbershops? The mobile vans, and then we've created a number of kiosks and libraries in Southern Delaware and looking at doing some more kiosks in uh, Newcastle County. 
So going back to uh, Ray, uh, who we started with, so you know he obviously had tons of struggles uh, with how care uh, would be provided in sort of a traditional office setting. However, you know through the Center for Virtual Health or more of a virtual primary care setting, you know he has the ability to self schedule. You know we have a fair amount of capacity because a lot of our work is asynchronous, so we're really just doing a lot of texting with patients. So we have the ability to do sort of more on-demand care. So um, myself or one of my care, uh, one of my colleagues was, uh, is able to quickly see him, sort of get, gather our history. And then in terms of the next steps, we know that he needs to do, get some blood work done to sort of figure out how this can occur. We know that there's some barriers and limitations to going to the uh, lab. So we have the ability to send out a kit to him. He can get blood work done. We then get the results a few days later, have the ability to text or talk to him in terms of what the diagnosis <laughs> and what some of the uh, treatments may be. We then engage with some of the other team members uh, to provide education to him. We know that because of his age and having low blood count, uh, he needs to have a screening test for colorectal cancer. So rather than the patient trying to go on hold and then making an appointment, we have the ability you know, through partnerships to automatically make that appointment for him so that that barrier or that additional call he doesn't need to do. And then you know, once we take care of a lot of his medical needs, uh, then we can have him engage with our behavioral health specialist to sort of talk a little bit about his stressors and then and prescribe him some of the apps uh, to help him with some of his depression and, and, and his uh, sleep issues. So I'm hoping you're able to demonstrate, you're able to see that, you know, there is a lot of fragmentation, a lot of frustration and a lot of time with the way some of the care would have been for Ray if he was in a traditional practice, but now being in a virtual center, how we're able to eliminate a lot of those barriers, make care a lot easier, frictionless, and he's able to get the things he needs rather than it being in a sequential order, we're able to sort of work as a team to address a lot of his barriers and get to resolution as quickly as possible. So I think, you know, looking at where healthcare is going. We know that digital health, digital technology is going to be, you know, a key driver to how we're going to provide care, but it's still going to be rooted in relationship-based care where the patient is, the, is at the center. And, you know, if you're able to form and forge that longitudinal relationship with that team enabled by technology, I think that's going to lead to you know, the quadruple aim that we started with, where we're going to have better outcomes, lower cost, and everyone is just going to be happier. So with that, um, I know we missed our break, but, um, you know, we still have another 20, 30 minutes for questions. So hopefully this gave you a little flavor around virtual digital health, what we're doing here at Christiana Care, and how this model um, can lead to the quadruple aim. Thank you so much. I am looking for the questions because I was distracted. So give me one second. Let's see. Uh, okay, question. You mentioned that you had doctors in the family. Can you tell us again your family members in healthcare and how did you decide which undergrad and grad and medical school to attend? So in terms of uh, family members, so um, my dad's a, a primary care doctor uh, and then a number of his siblings um, are also uh, physicians in, in various different uh, specialties and then <laughs> And then uh, a number of my cousins, so those that are in the same generation as me, where they, uh, the, their parents immigrated to this country, obviously, are, are in healthcare as well, too. Um, and then in terms of deciding where to go, 
you know, there's obviously a number of different paths to take um, after high school. You know, the traditional path is you go to a, a four-year college degree. You know, you end up taking your MCATs uh, and, and a lot of your prerequisites for medical school, apply to medical school. And, you know, medical school is becoming extremely competitive to get into. So, you know, most people end up just going to, you know, either the schools that they get into or the schools where they may get the most financial aid. Um, personally, I knew pretty early on through the experiences that I wanted to go to healthcare. So there are a number of these di direct medical programs where you're accepted into medical school out of high school. Uh, you have to maintain certain grades and certain scores on, on certain standardized tests, and then you matriculate or you enter into medical school. So I felt that that was the path I wanted to take because I, I sort of knew where I wanted, where I wanted to go, and, and it was one less barrier that I had. Uh, and then, you know, personally, I, I ended up choosing Union College and Albany Med as my undergrad in medical school, primarily because of that combined degree program where I had exposure to not only uh, medical school, but also sort of that uh, the MBA and health systems administration. And knowing that I wanted to take more of a systems approach, I think it provided me a pretty broad pragmatic training. And I ended up then doing a broad residency training. So I, I think I primarily chose it uh, because it was a liberal arts education. I knew that I was getting broad training and I was able to get into medical school out of, out of college, or sorry, out of high school. Awesome. Um, so we have a couple questions about telehealth and its effectiveness with mental health providers, counseling, psychiatric visits, diagnosing mental disorders. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, in May of 20, or in March of 2020, a lot of things uh, shifted to telehealth. And out of all of the medical specialties, I would say that the mental health providers have probably adopted, adapted, and continue to do the most amount of telehealth, virtual health out of all of the various different specialties. So I think there, um, it's a great way to connect with people uh, because there's, it's primarily history-based. There's not that much from a physical exam standpoint. So I think it's a great modality to connect, connect with people. I know some aspects of mental health is really you know, facial expressions, body, body language. And, you know, I think with improvements in video technologies, also the ability to doing texting, I think there are, uh, there are better ways to, that mental health providers are able to get a sense of how one is doing. Um, and then, you know, from a mental health standpoint, a lot of it is this continuous journey. So, you know, I may treat a lot of patients that have depression, anxiety, ADHD, and, you know, there, some of it is psychotherapy, some of it is medications, and we want to know objectively, are they improving? And through the use of virtual health, I can deploy various surveys. So there, there's things, you know, there's depression uh, questionnaires, there's ADHD questionnaires, there's anxiety questionnaires, and then in the beginning of therapy, you know, their anxiety score is 10. And then after therapy plus medications, their anxiety score is down to a two. So we know that there's things are improving and we're able to continue the way that we're providing care. And then I think the last uh, thing on that is that, you know, there was a lot of regulatory things in terms of needing to be in person uh, at least once a year, but I think the federal government and the state governments are starting to revisit um, some of those rules that were in play prior to the pandemic to be able to allow more virtual health, telehealth, especially if it's leading to better outcomes when you're looking at anxiety scores, depression scores. Thank you. Um, 
I've seen some questions about security issues, ransomware attacks, um, looking at things like monitoring the information, traveling to the technology, software available on every device and network on, or only certain ones. Can you talk a little bit about the security that's come to pass? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a, a great question. And, you know, it's a huge thing that we're looking at. You know, at Christiana, we have a, a chief information security officer, privacy officer, and before we deploy any technology or any service, the organization does a, a sort of thorough evaluation, you know, from a technology and privacy and security standpoint. And similar to like HIPAA compliant, right? So in, in healthcare, we, we talk a lot about HIPAA, so to ensure that there's patient confidentiality, there's various different security technology layers in terms of data security. And there are certain certifications that companies need to ensure that it, the information is as safe as possible. Whenever we're, even in that example that I showed you with information coming from your Apple Watch to our electronic health record, it, it was a, a six month process for that to happen when we knew you know, we were dealing with Apple and Cerner, which are you know, two multi-billion dollar companies that have huge data security uh, teams. And you know, we were all on the same mental model, but it was a huge process to ensure that uh, there was no leakage of information and data. So I think we, we take a huge, um, we invest a lot in data security. We do a huge uh, evaluation before launching anything. And uh, we're also recognizing that, uh, you know, when this first started, we wanted to partner with 20, 30 different companies. And the challenge with that is security and also having tons of silos. So we're now starting to really have limited partnerships and really trying to have everything go through one funnel so that if it enters our larger organization ecosystem and goes through that security check, then we know it's going to be safe inside um, sort of the organization's firewalls. Tim, I think you had a question. Why don't you go ahead? All right. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Dr. Patel, not, not a difficult question per se. As you may be aware, the Academy DPHA has been uh, working on a project called Delaware Health Force, where we're looking at medically underserved areas healthcare provider shortage areas throughout the state, in particular in the rural parts of Kent and Sussex County, and uh, trying to apply some intelligence to available data on how we're going to solve shortages. Is telehealth at a place where it, in fact, can help provide a solution, at least in part, for some of these shortage areas, which heretofore would have been shortage areas based on geography. However, of course, telehealth doesn't care about geography uh, in the same way. That's a great question. And um, I'm actually, myself, along with some of my colleagues are in the process of writing a paper uh, on this topic. And we, uh, it's around sort of this that digital divide. So some of it's from a digital equity standpoint, and then the other is where patients live. So we knew, you know, over the over 2020 and 2021, we looked at sort of virtual and both either uh, phone visits and, and video visits throughout the state, and saw if there were any cold spots and hot spots, and then try to track that where there may be lower socioeconomic, lower broadband access. And when we looked at just telemedicine at the uh, largest umbrella, including video visits and phone visits, it was great to see that there, there weren't any sort of hot spots or cold spots. So we had good penetration and good utilization throughout the state. So we know that people are using it. And then we're now looking, sort of doing a, a, a deeper look at that information to say, now that people are using it, are we le is that leading to you know, comparable outcomes? So if someone goes 
if I see you, Tim, at, in the office, and then I see Kate only virtually, um, are both of you receiving, you know, comparable care? And on some of the preliminary information, we're finding that um, it's comparable in, in some areas, virtual may be even better in terms of getting to blood pressure goals or, or diabetes goals better. Um, so I think it's optimistic to see that things are improving. But one of the things that we did learn um, is in some zip codes where there may not be as much broadband, um, at least in 2020 and half of 2021, there was lower utilization uh, or use of video visits. So that's where we've started to partner with the libraries, uh, along with other key stakeholders within the, the state to say broadband access, especially to do high quality video, uh, may be a barrier in certain areas. So are there ways that we can you know, partner with companies so that those individuals who may not have the ability to conduct a video visit from home are now provided the appropriate tools and technologies to do so. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute Bruce Brosey, who has a question. Hang on, Bruce, you gotta unmute yourself. I just asked you to unmute, so something should pop up on your screen. Got it. How's that? Perfect. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I'm in the um, <clears throat> Christiana Healthcare um, as a patient. I live eight miles inside Pennsylvania. I can go to Christiana as much as I like to see my doctor. I cannot do telehealth between Pennsylvania and Delaware. Um, is there going to be some change coming forward with that uh, restriction? Uh, great question. And I think that's, uh, I hope so. And, you know, <laughs> what we've done uh, to combat that is, you know, I currently have licenses in eight different states. You know, I, obviously I reside here in, in Delaware. I, I would say the majority of the patients I take care of live in Delaware. Uh, but we know that our catchment area, you know, is the four surrounding states. And we also know that uh, some individuals that live in Delaware, maybe during the summer may spend uh, their winters in Florida. So we're starting to, you know, get licenses in multiple states because sort of historically, the, from a regulatory standpoint, each state um, requires you to get a license and go through their medical board. Uh, we're starting to see some improvements where it may be analogous to, you know, the common application in when you're in high school applying to college, right? So there's one application and you can send it to 20 different schools. So the same is happening within licensure for the various different states. So there's a compact where, you know, if you're a part of the compact, then you have access to becoming a provider in 30 different states. So I imagine in the next year that will occur. It may take another two to three years to get the feds to say, rather than each state mandate licensure, it's done at a federal level. And then it will eliminate a lot of those barriers that you had mentioned. And then I think the, the last thing that some states are doing is they're providing telemedicine only licenses. Uh, so Florida is one of them. So I have a telemedicine only license. So, you know, if I were your provider located in Delaware, you could physically see me in Delaware. And then if I have a telemedicine license in Pennsylvania, then I can conduct, you know, virtual visits, you know, from the comfort of your home. Thank you. That's great. I like that plan. Um, strange uh, I believe your mother's on the line. She says you did a very good presentation and she's very good. Um, I want to point that out because so the comments on in, in the chat are great and everybody is very, very appreciative. They're sharing their stories. It's fantastic. Um, what about, um, can you talk a little bit about maybe older generations handling the and feeling about healthcare going digital and how that's you know different from what they're used to? 
I think many people were like, I would say, let's just say if we look at the older generation from when they were go growing up, people were used to having the doctor come to your home, right? And we're trying to reinvent that where the care is happening back in the home. And that could be either virtually um, or physically back in the home, because we know that's where people feel comfortable. And there are a number of programs that we've launched over the last two years where that's sort of the guiding principles of the, the program that we've created. So <laughs> most recently, and many of you may have seen some things in the press is that we've created this hospital care at home program. So you're not doing well, you're at home, you go to the emergency room, they find that you have pneumonia. And traditionally you may spend three days in the hospital while you're in the hospital, they come in and you know they give you an antibiotic through your IV one or two times per day. They keep you on oxygen, and you know multiple people sort of come in and out of the your room, checking your blood pressure, giving you food, changing the garbage, um, cleaning the room, whatever it may be. In a span of three days, you interact or you see 250 different people. Your experience is sort of subpar because the food's not great. You don't sleep well. So now we're like, most of the care that you're getting is probably the doctor time in the room is probably less than 15 minutes per day. The nurse time in the room is probably less than, you know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes per day. Most of the times you're just sort of sitting there by yourself. So it, why don't we take the care that we're providing in the hospital and just bring it home where you have a hospital bed at home. We have some monitors rather than you pushing the call bell. And then maybe 10 minutes later, someone coming to your room, you push a button and then it's almost like you're on zoom right now. And then you see your nurse and, and whatever issue you have, you know, she addresses if, we, if me as the primary care provider need to see you while you're hospitalized, traditionally that's not going to happen, but that can happen. If we need to get two or three different specialists to figure out does Mrs. Jones need to do test A, B, or C, and, and it has to be like a, a conversation, again, you could do that the same way. And the, you know, we've admitted now a little under 20 patients and people have loved it because we're using, you know, door that, you know, you're getting quality food at home. People are um, coming to your home. They're compassionate. You're getting the same level of services that, that you were at home or at the hospital um, directly at your home. So that's just, you know, one example where we're taking, you know, a not so great example of being in the hospital and then translating it into the home. And then, you know, the second is, you know, over the last two years, there's been hundreds and thousands of patients that our team has taken care of that have had COVID-19. I think over the last two years, our team has sent 3 million text messages. We've interacted with 26,000 patients. Um, so it's like well over a hundred um, interactions with each patient. And, you know, if you have to imagine sending your doctor, you know, calling your doctor a, hun a hundred times over a course of two weeks when you're frightened, ill, um, you're not going to get a hundred calls back. If you have to think about, um, you know, talking to the doctor, the nurse, or, you know, multiple people when you're frightened, um, that's not going to happen. So I think a lot of individuals are starting to embrace uh, this way of providing care because they're getting a lot more attention. People are getting back to them quicker. Um, and, you know, there's a level of compassion and a level of connectedness that um, unfortunately is lost in how we're providing care in our offices, which is very transactional where, you know, at 10 minutes, you know, I'm in front of the computer the whole time because I have to click all these boxes and then get out of the room. And we now have the ability to sort of sit down and and spend more time with individuals because there's not a lot of the unnecessary things and um, that needs to occur from a regulatory uh, standpoint because now we can just solely focus on the issues you have 
And if we don't get everything addressed in this 10 minute or 20 minute block, then we can talk again a week from now or a month from now, because it's not onerous for you to drive, park, sit in the waiting room, get seen, and then do that sort of whole uh, rigmarole again. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. A um, couple of questions in the chat about what about the people who maybe can't afford this type of technology or can't afford, you know, a computer, can't afford a smartphone, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the, we've been fortunate at Christiana Care, uh, along with a number of other health systems uh, across the country, working with the Fed, the FCC, and, and various other national bodies to get federal funding and grant funding, um, you know, to help with that exact uh, issue that you brought up. And so we had gotten a number of iP iPads, uh, a number of iPhones and a lot of equipped technology. And we initially thought that most people would want that. Um, we got a lot of these, we enabled them, uh, but the overall utilization of it was pretty low. And you know, in surveying even those in the, uh, probably the most underserved neighborhoods of Delaware, uh, the vast majority of them had smartphones and the vast majority of them felt comfortable texting. And I think it was something that our team, you know, recognized that, you know, a lot of people do have these tools. They may not know how to navigate all aspects of it. Um, so I think, you know, there's some work that we're currently doing with that. Um, we just actually, as of yesterday, um, just got funded another large grant to provide prenatal care. So that's uh, care to those women that are pregnant uh, in underserved areas uh, throughout the state so that they have access to all the maternal services, all the high risk uh, OB services, uh, and then any devices that they may need if they have high blood pressure or, or diabetes during their pregnancy. And then we can work together um, to get them the care that they need. So I, I think the short answer is that I think most people have a lot of the tools. Uh, we're working with some individuals to provide tools. And then the, probably the most of the focus is how to increase one's literacy and comfort um, with utilizing apps and, and, and some of these digital devices that we have. Awesome. Um... Can you explain again how you collaborate cross disciplines to address patient conditions when you're using telemedicine and remote um, discussions? Yeah. Um, so I think the way that we're creating our, our offering is that we strongly feel that, you know, primary care is sort of the, the foundation um, to how we provide care. You know, if we look at care in the UK or other places throughout the, the world, I would say 90% of the providers are your family doctor primary care. So we're trying to take sort of that model and make primary care sort of the foundation. And then once you make primary care sort of the foundation, every, the, everything sort of comes into us. And, you know, we're fortunate sort of being a part of a, a clinically uh, integrated network. So a number of uh, specialists, um, obviously we're tied to a hospital. Um, you know, we have home phlebotomists, you know, we have an imaging center. So we have all the key components sort of within our ecosystem. So we have the ability to sort of send patients where they need to. So either A, they go from home to one of those sites or we bring the services to them, but we sort of are, um, help sort of shepherd a lot of that. And if that means they have a, a cardiac issue, then we talk to that cardiologist, get the recommendations, and then provide that care. So I'll give you a, an example. So I know yesterday I spoke to a patient um, who had uh, EKG done, which is, you know, you um, looking at the rhythm of your heart. Um, so he used his eye watch and it was abnormal. Um, he ended up going to one of the offices. He got an EKG. Um, I was able to see it. He took, he snapped a picture of it. So now if it was a traditional setting, I, you know, I would say, hey, you have an abnormal EKG, 
uh, I want you to go see a cardiologist. They try to make an appointment and maybe, maybe a few weeks from now. What we were able to do is I recognized that there's something was abnormal, you know, very quickly uh, sent a message to one of the cardiologists saying, you know, I'm concerned that they, he or she may, or that he may have this. Um, I wanna make sure that there's nothing wrong with the structure of his heart or rhythm of his heart. So that was yesterday. So then today he had a ultrasound of his heart done. Um, we, were, we were able to schedule him to get blood work done uh, at a lab near him. And then by Monday, a device is gonna get mailed out to his home, uh, which he's gonna keep on his chest wall for two weeks to monitor uh, to see if there's any abnormal heart rhythm. He was able to do all of this without going in to see the cardiologist. Um, I already got some of his blood work results back and you know, he had some lower you know, magnesium levels. So you know, I told him to go on Amazon and purchase magnesium and he did that and he's gonna get, gonna get that tomorrow. So it, it's just, we're able to do so much once you start to be creative about how you provide care. But I think it's all foundational. If we're the port of entry and then we work with all of these different nodes, like we can get you to where you need to do. And we know healthcare is complicated. So we really want to be like your, your concierge navigator um, through all things uh, health and wellness. All right, let's do uh, one last question. Um, so this one is kind of two questions smushed together. Um, so the first talks about the value of a physician actually lying, laying hands on a patient and, and losing that value with telemedicine, um, seeing things that a person maybe doesn't know could be a problem, but the physician notices. And then the second question is, do you see an issue with a fee structure for virtual providers when it's different than face-to-face -face providers and actually being able to lie hands on a Great question. So, you know, the, for the first one, I think we all know that it's history, history, history. So uh, the majority of the times the history trumps your physical, but we know that there are times when sort of that in-person is needed. And, and that's when, you know, based on the symptoms that they have, uh, based on, you know, it, maybe if it's a once a year, once every two years, once every three years where we may see you, <laughs> in person or based on the complaint, we think it's needed for you to go in person, then um, we'll coordinate that. And I think it's, um, it's definitely an important thing, but I think a lot of the key things in terms of vital signs, you know, we're able to capture if you have, you know, if we send out a blood pressure cuff to you, you have a smartwatch or something to track your, your uh, heart rates. Like those are all things that we're able to capture. And I think a lot of people, We'll have oxygen eaters and, and oxygen checkers with pulse ox and thermometers from COVID. So I think a lot of the biometric stuff we're able to capture. Um, and then there are a number of companies that now have the ability uh, to do virtual exams. So there are connections to, you know, to one's phone where you can look in one's ears, the back of your throat, and then there are digital stethoscopes. Um, so we uh, we have them in, in our community access points. Um, so if someone goes there and it's needed, um, or in many instances, you know, it, it's sort of a cultural slash like uh, a thing that makes the patient feel better. Um, we obviously, um, and, and I, I would say, even if you talk to cardiologists, I mean, they listen to your heart, but for the most part, they're still going to do an EKG and an echocardiogram and some of that information that they glean from that is going to supersede, you know, from a listening standpoint, but knowing that, you know, that's sort of a part of like the traditional exam. Uh, we are doing that at our community sites where if I'm physically not there, then, you know, the nurse um, would put the stethoscope here and then through my headset, I'll be able to hear the heart. Um, and then, you know, there are, there are a few things that, I feel are superior with this where rashes, for instance, um, you know, you may see the dermatologist once a year, uh, but we have ways where if I think there's a mole or something you have on your skin that's concerning, 
then I, I sort of launch a pathway where once a month you get a text message saying, hey, take a picture of your mole. And then, you know, you, you could see your mole over a course of a year and then see like, oh, it looks like it stayed the same in size and quality or, hey, it's gotten bigger. Now we, we should proceed with, um, you know, doing a biopsy or some intervention. And then sort of the, the second question around payment. So during the pandemic uh, and even still, you know, there's um, sort of payment parity with sort of fee-for-service for virtual visits or um, telemedicine visits and in-person visits, uh, but we know that's not gonna last. And the way that we're trying to structure our practice and, and I think where healthcare is moving is really moving more towards like a, a subscription model. Um, so I think we're all used to paying $10, $15 a month for Netflix, or you get the premium Zoom account, or you know your Comcast, or whatever bill that may be, you get unlimited access to that service. And that's sort of the way that we're structuring it with um, either consumers directly, uh, with employers or insurance companies where we know that care is happening continuously. Um, and that could be a text message, that could be a video visit, that could be a phone call, but ultimately I'm responsible for your health and well-being. And, and we know that if, if you get your immunizations, you do your cancer screening uh, and a lot of the other components around wellness, then you're gonna be healthier, live longer and be happier. And that's gonna be something that the employer wants, the insurance company wants. Um, so I think this new model of um, similar to what it was maybe 30, 40 years ago with capitated is sort of like coming full circle, uh, but has you know a little bit more risk associated with it where our team is responsible for sort of the total cost uh, of care. And if we're able to keep you out of the hospital healthy and well, then you know we'll obviously fare well you know from a financial standpoint and you know, it's the right thing uh, from a patient standpoint. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. This was fascinating and I loved it. So thank you. Um, there are a lot more questions in the chat. What we've been doing is um, I've been collating them in a list, sending them to you, and then you can just type some answers. Would that be okay if I do that? That's perfect. All right, fantastic. Um, Everybody, thank you for coming tonight. I hope you have a uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Next week, we're going to be hearing from a nurse, nurse anesthetist about uh, anesthesia and nurse anesth anesthetists. Say that five times fast. Um, so we will see you all next Thursday. Thank you so much for coming.